I'm Mike Hoggard, and I still believe the King James Bible is the absolute, inerrant, inspired Word of God. It has absolutely no mistakes, and I trust every single word in it. Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. Let's continue our series on Matthew 24. And let me say this at the beginning, and I mentioned this uh, yesterday during Pastor Mike Online. I'm one of these that I don't doubt the Bible anymore. Not like I used to. And, and maybe I, I don't know, maybe I never really did, but I was taught a lot in two different Bible colleges that there are mistakes in all the translations and you've got to retranslate the Greek and Hebrew yourself and always be a Bible corrector. And one of the things that God has absolutely removed far, far away from me is doubting anything in this, in this book. I, I don't doubt it anymore. I believe it. And I believe that the words of this book are probably, well, without a doubt with me, more right, more reliable, more trustworthy, more perfect, more sure, more relevant now than at any other time in history, including the day that these words were written down. Now, don't misquote me. Don't think that I just said the original manuscripts were wrong. I don't believe that for a second. I think everything that Moses wrote, David, Solomon, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, some guy named Acts, whoever that is, I think everything that they wrote down was absolutely 100% the Word of God. It was perfect without any error whatsoever. But the words that they were writing were in a small way for them at that time, but in a more perfect way, they are for us here and right now. And if we're the generation of people, people have been saying this, I know, for thousand years. If we're the generation of people who are going to see things like Matthew 24, wars and rumors of wars and the abomination that maketh desolate and a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and Babylon is fallen, is fallen. If we're the people, the generation that's actually going to see these things with our eyes in our lifetime happen, then I say that this Bible and every word in it was written for us. And the words in it are right. I had one of those <gasps> moments last night. I'm not going to tell you what it was. It, it doesn't really, well, maybe it might doesn't really bear much into what I'm going to share with you today. We're still in Matthew 24. But it was on a passage of Scripture that I had read hundreds, hundreds of times. I had quoted it multiple times, hundreds and hundreds of times. You know, if you listen to me over the years, since, what, 2009, when I started doing the Watchman broadcast, 
you know there's some verses I just keep going back to, right? Okay? And uh, sometimes I feel guilty about it. Mike, don't you know there's other parts in the Bible? Yeah, okay, but there's some things just stick out to me. And there's probably a thousand ways of pointing back to certain verses in the Bible. And this particular passage of Scripture that I had one of those wow moments with last night, I read it scores of times, maybe hundreds of times, referenced it multiple times, and believed it. But it's one thing to believe it, and then it's another thing when you actually realize what it's talking about. And it was one of those moments last night, and, it, and it's just one of those things where, again, I said, Mike, that Bible is 100% right. And it involves secrets that very evil people in this world don't want anybody to know about. They don't want anybody to know what it is that they really do and why they do it. It's a secret that thousands of people, more than likely, have died for. Died because they found out about it one of those things. It's a dangerous, dangerous secret. Okay? It's a, it's a mystery. But all things get revealed. Anything that's covered now, eventually, it's coming to light. Mark it down. Well, it's already marked down. God wrote it in the scriptures. That applies to what the deepest, darkest secrets of the Illuminati might be, well, that might involve some of yours, things that you don't want dug up, things you're not confessing, things you're not getting out of your life, or you're not letting God take it out of your life. I assure you God's going to take it out. So I just wanted to start out that way, just letting you know that I'm Mike Hoggard, and I still believe the King James Bible is the absolute, inerrant, inspired Word of God. It has absolutely no mistakes, and I trust every single word in it. These words are my life. These words are my ministry. These words have kept my marriage together. These words have helped me raise my children. Now they're helping me raise my grandchildren. These words are the words of eternal life, and I'm not about to back down from them now. So we've been studying Matthew chapter 24, and we've just been, I don't know, believing what it says, okay? And it says, let's start it in verse 4, because that does seem to be relevant. I'm, I'm actually going to focus on verse 8 today. But let's go back to verse 4. Jesus answered unto end of them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Absolutely. Take heed that no man, no man, no matter how well-intentioned they are, take heed you could write in here, take heed, or just maybe to the side, because it's the Bible. Take heed that Mike Hoggard does not deceive you. It's good advice. Excellent advice. I could be wrong. Then he said, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. These are things we've talked about. Let me put this verse up on the screen, verse 6. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now that's sort of what we're going to focus on today, is what that sorrow Thing is all about and, and what relevance does it have pertaining to the events that are going to take place in the end times and we're making an assumption that the rapture, the translation, the being caught up hasn't happened yet. That's what we're believing and as I go more through this series I'm going to lay out reasons why I believe what I believe concerning Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, 
and other places. But something I wanted to point out here, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, he said. Now, I've already covered that issue, but the idea of a rumor, if you go and look that word up, and Webster's, if we have this built into the Pure Bible Search software, purebiblesearch.com, and you can download that for free, and it has Webster's 1828 Dictionary built into it. So you can click on any word. Now with the word rumor, you click on it and nothing will come up. And the reason being is because the King James is a British Bible in English, then it has British spelling of words. They spell rumor with an O-U-R. We spell it with an O-R. So if you look at the bottom there, it'll say, you know, rumor with a line through it, O-U-R. Just kind of erase the O-U-R and just replace it with an O-R and you'll see the word rumor. It'll tell you that it's an idea or a story or a news or event that is passed from one person to another, but it doesn't necessarily have an authoritative source. That doesn't mean it's not true. Just because a rumor is told, that in itself doesn't mean that you don't believe it, it's nonsense. It's a, if it's a rumor, it's a lie. No, not necessarily. If it's a rumor, it means that, well, I heard this from John. John heard it from Bill. Bill heard it from Barry. Barry heard it from Larry. Larry heard it, heard it from Harry. And Harry got it from Gary. And Gary got it from Mary. So I have to, I don't know where it came from. And subtle changes may have been made. So now, here's what I wanted to point out. That's in stark contrast you understand the word contrast. This is white and this is black. When you put white and off-white together, you may not be able to see much of a difference. But if you put white and black side by side, you're going, oh, I know which one's which, okay? I used to paint houses and you could say, we painted all the walls white. Actually, they weren't. They were a Glidden's antique white and when you look at antique white up against white white, you would say, well, that's more of a cream tan color, like a beige. But if you paint a whole house that color, you're going, that's white. See my point? The contrast is a rumor is a story passed from one person to another person. It doesn't have really an identifiable source or an authoritative source. That is in stark contrast to the Word of God. We don't believe cunningly defies fables and we don't, we don't follow rumors. Now this is what we have here with, in our hands, that which we've handled, the words of life. These are not just rumors and, you know, bedtime stories and campfire stories that, you know, fathers pass down to their children and their grandchildren and and it made the children go, ooh, ah, you mean there was giants? And we, we don't follow rumors. We believe the absolute inerrant truth. So here's what I get out of this. There's coming a time when, let's say it like this, things are going to hit the fan. You know what that phrase means, right? Okay, it's gonna be a mess. And I think 99.9% .9 of the world is gonna be basing what they believe is going on upon rumors. Because that's, let's face it, that's all the internet has, more or less. It's a bunch of rumors, social media. Rumors, right? I mean, how much of the stuff that you see every day on Facebook or Twitter or Parler or any of these other Instagram or whatever, how many things that come across the daily internet are actually 100% the gospel truth? See, I'm one of these that is pretty critical 
about things on the internet. I just don't believe everything I read. Maybe I want to believe it. Maybe I'll go, yeah, that sounds about right to me. But do I know it to be true? Absolutely not. Would I, would I gamble on it? No. Would I base my eternal salvation on it? Absolutely not. But you give me scripture, 100% guaranteed. I know that Bible's right. I know that scripture's right. And see, that's what I'm talking about. There's going to be a group of people who all they're going to have to know or believe about what's going on in their world is rumors. And who knows where rumors started? We, we know, we know for a fact that at one time the CIA uh, ran a program where they leaked information to the press as if it were truth. It was a, I f- forgot the name of it, but the CIA was giving news reporters stories that they wanted out in the press. They wanted them to be read on the radio news, on the TV news, put it in the newspapers, so on and so on and so on. Now, what, what is that? That's called propaganda. That's actually supposed to be against the law in this country. Government's not supposed to be propagandizing it's people feeding it full of lies and things it wants it to believe, even though we know that goes on all the time. And from things that I've heard, and I believe it, but it's a rumor, but I've heard that major well-paid reporters all over this country, 4 a.m. every morning can go to a top secret internet server and get talking points and news items that they're paid to deliver every single day. Okay. That I believe, uh, Richard Doty, he's a guy I've featured one time at a pastor mic online, look him up. D O T Y I believe is his name. He was a counterintelligence officer working for Kirtland air force base and his job was to make sure that some of the secret things, top secret things that they were doing at that Air Force base remained top secret. And if anything leaked out, then it was his job to come up with an alternative story. And he was asked point blank, did you pay people, reporters and such to spread information that you yourself came up with that you knew probably wasn't true. And he said, oh yeah, we did it all the time. In fact, we paid him well. And when pressed by Stephen Greer doing the interview, when pressed by Stephen Greer, whether or not, you know, he would give the names of some of these people, he said, nah, I'm not going to do that. Well, can you name some networks? Nah, I'm not going to do that. Can you name some newspapers? Can you give us an idea? I'm not telling you who they were. But he said, we paid him. We paid him all in cash and we paid him very well. And sure enough, they told the stories that we wanted them to tell. So who knows where 90% of the news comes from in this, in this world, who knows where it comes from. But I know that when it comes from here, it's right. So two groups of people now operating in these last days, the people who all they have for a version of truth is rumors. And then God's people who are going to believe what God said. And you know me, believe believe it or not, I still get bugged over people who say they're God's people. But a majority of the conspiracy ideas that they believe in their mind and heart are based upon false rumors. Rumors that they want to believe because they want to believe that certain things like this are true. But the truth of it is, there's no evidence in scripture whatsoever. And the thing that God showed me last night, and I'll tell you this, it scared me. It scared me. The thing that God showed me last night was something that I had been seeking him on. Asking God, is this true? And if it is true, then you know me. You know you have to show it to me in the Bible. He did. 
And just the rumor of it was scary enough. The reality of it, and I, I, there's no doubt I'm going to let you know as soon as I get all my facts and all my ducks in a row, you know I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to keep it in. I'm going to tell everybody. The truth of it will blow your mind. Pure evil in this world by people that in some cases you might believe, in some cases you would never believe it. But it's in the Word of God. All right, now let's get back to this. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Let's compare Matthew 24 again with Mark 13, Luke 21, Matthew 24, 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Mark 13, 8. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. And there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. Luke 21, 10. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. I have a theory on this, and it's just a theory, but it's, it's something to th think about because we've always had over the years, over let's say the last 200 years, there's always been wars where multiple nations were involved against other multiple nations. World War I, World War II, uh, even in Korea, uh, I'm talking about American wars because those are the ones I know, Vietnam, um, when the first Gulf War was played out, it was um, several member nations of the United Nations. Um, Second Gulf War, same thing. So there's always been in the last 150, 100 years, nations against nations. And, you know, rightfully so, people during World War I we're thinking, this is the end times. Look at this. I mean, my goodness, people are dying. It's a world war. This surely is the, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. World War II, same thing. People, what is fulfillment of Bible prophecy? What if World War III happens? Oh my God, that will surely fulfill Bible prophecy. But I just like to, I don't know, look at things a little differently sometimes and ask the question, what if it doesn't mean that? What if it means literally what it says. And what it says is, we look at Matthew 24, nation, singular, against nation, singular. Kingdom, singular, against kingdom, singular. And that's also in Mark 13, and that's also in Luke 21. In other words, in all three of those passages, they're all in 100% agreement that it's a kingdom against a kingdom. He could have said nations because he does so in multiple places in the Bible. The nations, the nations, the nations. But he doesn't say it that way here. He says kingdom. And I'm, again, I just believe the Bible. I believe that God would have used the words that he wanted to use to tell us what he wanted to tell us, to give us the exact details of what he wants us to know. And he doesn't say nations against nations. He says nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There are two kingdoms that I'm aware of that operate and govern the affairs of every man, woman, child, and every country in this world. That is the kingdom of God in heaven and Satan's kingdom. Kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of hell. Those are the two kingdoms that I'm aware of. And I think that all of the wars that have ever been fought, all of the battles, all of the skirmishes, all of the whatevers, terrorist acts, whatever, all of those, I think, 
will pale in comparison to this one war right here. A kingdom against a kingdom and a nation. We know that God calls us a peculiar nation, meaning that we as Christians are a nation in and of ourselves. Number one, the word nation implies ethnicity. You know, somebody's Italian. When we say somebody's Italian, generally redheaded freckled face doesn't come to mind, even though there are some. When we say someone is African, blonde haired, blue eyed doesn't naturally come to mind either. Okay? When we say someone is Scandinavian in, in their appearance, black hair and black skin doesn't come to mind. So generally people, America is an exception, generally people are divided up into countries, we call them nations, because of their unique ethnic identity. And that's not, uh, it's not racism at all. It's the fact that people are drawn together into groups, number one, by a common language. We know that God divided the nations by the languages. They're also drawn together by family origin and familiar characteristics. In other words, your family looks like my family. I bet we have more than one thing in common. People are drawn to that. Okay. And again, it's nothing racist about that. It's just sort of people, black folk like to hang around black folk, white folk like to hang around white folk, Italians like to hang around Italian. When people came to this country from all over the world, who did they seek out? Their own kind. Because that was people they were comfortable with, right? They, ate the, they knew what kind of food to eat. They, knew, they spoke the language. They knew the traditions. So it, was, it made it better to assimilate into America. And what I'm saying is, you have all these different nations out there, but there are two types of people in this world, people of God and people from hell, or people who are going to hell. And we know that there is angels on God's side and saints on God's side, and we know that there are lost people on God's side and all the devils are on, or excuse me, the devil's side. They're all on the devil's side. I said that wrong, but you get what I'm saying. So I think that it just boils down to two nations fighting one another, the wheat and the tares, the good ground fruit and the thorns. One of them's going to win. One of them isn't. So let's look beyond these three passages, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, 10. Let's look for other places in the Bible that sort of help us out with that. Isaiah chapter 19 is one. Verse one, the burden of Egypt, behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud. He cometh into Egypt and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. I want you to notice that the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, because I'm telling you, two religions in this world, one of them worships the real true God, and there isn't anything in this world, except of course mankind, that's made in his image, so we don't make idols, we don't carve statues, we don't make them out of ceramic or stone or, or marshmallows or tortillas or anything like that. He is the unseen God, and there's no way in the world that we can carve an image out to him. And then there's every other religion that needs something on this earth to bow to. That's an idol. And notice when the real God shows up, when the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and comes into Egypt, the idols of Egypt get moved at his presence. Remember when they took the Ark of the Covenant and set it before Dagon? Did Dagon move at his presence? Oh, yeah, he did. He fell down on his face. And when they set him back up the next day, guess what happens? He falls down again. Only this time he's cutting pieces over it. And I like that. Verse 2, And I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight everyone against his brother and everyone against his neighbor. Notice this. City 
against city and kingdom against kingdom. The spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I will destroy the counsel thereof, and they shall seek to the idols, and to the charmers, and to them that have familiar spirits, and to the wizards. Notice there's four things here. I always love seeing that now. Now that I can count things in the Bible, when I look at a list like this, I'm going, what is that? One, two, three, four. Sure enough, it's four. Notice that he's talking about the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst. I will destroy the council. They shall seek to the idols, the charmers, them that have familiar spirits, and wizards. Four, principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness, high places, false gospel, another gospel, another gospel, any other gospel, any other gospel. They're going to be seeking to these things that they've trusted in, like in Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, the soothsayers, and the magicians. They were trying to uh, get Nebuchadnezzar, tell us your dream, we'll tell you the interpretation of it. And Nebuchadnezzar said, no, I'll cut your head off. So who was it? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on God's side telling it to him. Isn't that great? The four gospels is one kingdom. And then on the other kingdom, you have the idols, the charmers, the familiar spirits, and the wizards and they're not going to make it. And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel Lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. That cruel Lord and fierce king is, number one, the king of fierce countenance that Daniel described. Number two, he's from a nation of fierce countenance uh, that comes to us from Deuteronomy chapter 28. Like, uh, alligators and crocodiles. Crocodiles have a fierce, they always look like they're in a foul mood. Always. Okay. Meanwhile, dolphins and dolphins don't eat people, right? They don't eat people. You don't have to worry about dolphins biting you and tearing you to shreds because they have a smile on their face. They're happy. But here comes a nation of cruel, of fierce countenance and they are a fierce king, God shall rule over them. And here sets a, an example of things I've said before. When people will not respond to God's authority, God puts them under cruel authority. Does this nation have a chance? Right now, I believe it does. And I'm doing everything I can. Will you join with me to try to spread the word of the gospel and of the word of God? Hey, just get people to read the Bible and let God deal with them. Let God draw them in. If you're not a good soul winner, if you're not good at talking to someone into getting saved, I know some that are, but a lot of people I know aren't. So let the Bible do the work. Get them to start reading the Bible because I still think there's people in this country that can be saved. I think they at least have the right mindset. Do they fear a God of some kind? They fear maybe the God. They love their country. And I think there's time yet to save some people. Help us spread the word while we have a chance because if not, Rest assured, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, those three will pale in comparison to the fierce king that God will set over this country. Mark it down. Daniel chapter 2 then is an example of the kingdom against kingdom. The toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Then Daniel 2, 44, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Daniel 4, 3, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. So in Daniel 2, we have the two kingdoms. We have the divided kingdom divided against itself because it's iron and clay on the toes so we know it will not stand because the, no matter how strong the rest of that idol and those kingdoms are, 
they've set as their foundation clay mingled with iron. It's doomed to fail and it's going to fail. But then we have, and, and that kingdom's going to fall and it's going to be ground to powder. It's going to be blown away with the wind. And then God's kingdom is going to be established, a, king that will, a kingdom that will never end. So you see it there in Daniel, a kingdom against a kingdom, a nation of people who has been mingled now with God's or a nation of people who have God as their father. You see it now? Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And he's referring to the divided kingdom of the iron and the clay. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How? Let me stop right here. You know, I learned from uh, reading the Alberto series from Jack Chick, Chick Publications. If you've not read the Alberto series, read the Alberto series. So it's a full-size comics, and it gives the life of Alberto Rivera. And Alberto Rivera at times would go when he would perform exorcisms to cast out devils. Now, at the time, I'm just going, I don't get this. I thought the Catholic Church was all evil. Surely they don't have Jesus on their side. How can the Catholic Church cast out devils? Well, I understand it now. That's how you know that his kingdom will not stand. You think those, all those devils uh, all go to parties together and they're all buddies they're all friends and they've made blood covenants with each other and they, you know, pinky swear each other. Hey, we'll never turn on each other. All for one and one for all. Do you think those devils are like that? Shoot, no. You ever seen animals cannibalize their own? You ever see animals in the wild kingdom go after their own kind? If a lion wants to take over uh, another lion's pride of lions. If he wants to take over the lionesses and all the cubs, you know what he does? First thing he does is go and eat the cubs or kills them, in some cases eats them, eats the cubs of the lion that they're wanting to take over. They don't allow his offspring to live. That's going against your own kind for crying out loud. Okay? And that happens in the animal kingdom as well. And in the beast kingdom where all these devils are, shoot, they're not all buddy-buddy on the same side. Don't count on it. That's how you know their nation's going to be divided against itself. Satan, Satan will cast out Kate, Satan. He'll work against himself. If Satan cast out Satan, his, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? That's how we know it won't. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then, there he mentions now, the kingdom. Then the kingdom of God is come unto you. And again, it's about one kingdom against another kingdom and no other war no other disagreement no other arm wrestling match none of thing none of those things will matter the only thing that's important is god's kingdom against satan's kingdom that's it now matthew 13 Verse 33, listen to this. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, I've explained that before. The number three, does it represent the Godhead? Yeah, at times. Resurrection, yeah, at times. What does it also represent? What is leaven? Leaven is like false doctrine and sin. 
I mean, so you just decided you were going to sneak a peek at a picture on the internet that you shouldn't look at. Is that all it takes? No. But that one, now you got to look at a bunch of others. And the next thing you know, you're all day on the internet looking at stuff you shouldn't look at. Or you quit smoking five years ago and you think, ah, one little cigarette won't hurt. <laughs> next thing you know, you're smoking the whole pack, three packs a day. Same thing. A little leaven goes a long way. So what does that leaven represent? That number three, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Hidden in three measures of meal. And it's waiting for the leaven to bring the, the lump to a certain point to where it's not really going to rise more than that to put it in the oven before it's fully risen. You're going to have bad bread. You got to wait till it's right. And this is what God is doing. He's letting sin. I preached on this here a while back. He's letting sin come to a head. It has to be this way. Sin has to just be magnified as absolute evil sin. And then God's going to do something about it. And he calls that like, this is the kingdom of heaven. But he's showing you when God's going to act. And then he says, verse 34, all these things spake Jesus unto them and unto the multitude in parables and without a parable spake he not unto them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying I will open my mouth in parables I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying declare unto us the parable of the tares and of the field and he answered and said unto them he that soweth the good seed is the son of man the field is the world the good seed are the children of the kingdom but the tares are the children of the wicked one now do you see the two kingdoms here Two different types of children. That's important. Very important. Keep that in mind. The birthing of a child is how God is going to give us an understanding of when these things occur. A child is to be born. Now, is it going to be a good child or a bad child? both. I'll show you that a little bit later. Uh, then he said, um, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. That's two kingdoms. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And they shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So he's telling us that just like the wheat and the tares, you have two different types of people, two different nations. Because if the devil sowed the seed of the tares, He's the father of the tares. If God sowed the seed of the good seed, then he's the father of the offspring of that seed. Two different fathers, two different nations. Just think of what God told, um, who was it, Rachel? He said, two different children in your womb. No, it wasn't Rachel. It was uh, Rebecca. Two children in your womb. Two different nations, two different types of people. They were twins, but they definitely were not identical twins. We know that Jacob came out sort of light, soft, complected. He wasn't, you know, queer or a sodomite or girly boy or anything like that. It's just that he liked his mom, he did things with his mother, he learned how to cook. And yes, I do believe it's possible to have 
for a man, some men to have some, some effeminate qualities and yet be fully men, fully respectable men. They don't necessarily have to be sodomites. And then you have the He-Man, Esau. I killed me a bear with my bare hands. Daddy wants me to go out and kill him some deer. I like to just jab them in the eye with my thumb and bring them down, choke them to death. I don't waste arrows shooting them. I mean, that's the kind of man Esau. I mean, I've hung around hunters all my life. And I've heard these braggadocious men tell the, oh my goodness, tell deer stories, tell how they did this and they did that. Yeah, we used to eat the heart right out of it. Yeah, we did that stuff. But that was Esau. And notice Esau had so much hair on his body that when Jacob was going to fake out his dad, he put goat fur on his arms. What does that tell you about Esau? There's a skin condition called hypertrichosis where people that have it literally just grow fur all over their body. They look like a werewolf. Circus people, Jojo the wolf boy, hypertrichosis. It's possible that Esau was something like that. But I want you to think about the two types. One's fair complected. One of them looks like a beast. And they hated each other. And there was enmity between them. It was nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Just like the Bible says. So you have that with the wheat and the tares. The children of the, uh, the, the wheat are the children of the kingdom. The tares, the dark, poisonous, evil seed of blackness and of darkness and of sin. And they're all growing up together. They're all living together. But one of these days, God's going to separate them out. And it's going to be this kingdom against this kingdom. Mark it down. Now, Ephesians 6, 11 is telling us to get ready for this war that's coming. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Two nations, two kingdoms, going at it. Only one of them is going to survive. Only one of them is going to win. Now, Matthew chapter 13. Look at this. Look at what he said here. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just just like in the harvest. Let's gather the, gather the uh, tares first. Then we'll gather the wheat. It's going to make it easy. Once we know the difference between each one, because again, the, the poison darnel turns black and it falls down. The wheat still stands straight up looking like the sun in his righteousness. Same thing here. So which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, yea, Lord. Then said he unto them, therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which, watch this, bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. You see it? They're not the same. Just like, just like these two covenants here in my Bible, there's the, there's the division right there. They're not the same. This covenant says do 100% 
and live. This covenant says you can't do, you never will do, you never have done. So I don't expect that, but what I expect you to do is believe. And even now, there are two factions growing in this world that they all say to read the Bible. Some people I know, a young man that I used to let preach here, he's chosen this covenant. Now is this new covenant. This represents, what did I count, like the fifth or sixth major uh, doctrinal stance on salvation that he's changed just since I've known him. The fifth or sixth major change he's made in his understanding of salvation. And now he says we must go back and keep as much of the law as we can in order to be saved and to stay saved. We're not of the same kingdom. That's the old. I want the new. Amen. Matthew 24. Now, think about this. Because this is, when I explain this word, some of you already know about it. And I think all of those times where we went through sorrow... They were sort of like, I see them like a, a, a little test of God and a training of God, getting us used to sorrow, that sorrow is part of it. Oh, the days I have mourned, sorrowed over past sins, relationships that are gone, gone forever. Things that Maybe I could have had. I'll never have. Sorrows coming in my life. They've been there. But there's coming one, the likes of which I've never seen. You know, I've never seen my wife in so much pain. I remember early on when we first got married, I took her down to visit my grandparents. I was so proud of my wife and I'd proud of my grandparents. I wanted them two to get together. I wanted the two very more, very important parts of my life to, to meet each other. And I wanted them to like each other. And they did. But my Mima, outstanding. You know, she was old school cook. Okay? Old school. A lot of hog lard. Okay, pork chops cooked and all that grease and stuff like that. Oh, that's good stuff. But I didn't know at the time my wife was having gallbladder problems and she ended up on the floor in my grandma's house screaming in agony. Well, I thought that was bad until she went into labor. That was bad. I wasn't prepared for that. So I've seen that kind of sorrow. Here's why I'm bringing this up. Matthew 24, 6. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginnings of sorrows. Mark 13 Almost identical, for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be earthquakes in diverse places. There shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. So now, what does he mean by that? Does he mean like a general sorrow where we're going, oh, man, I wish Joe Biden had become president. Man, I wish... You know, taxes weren't so high. Man, I wish we could just quit wearing these stupid masks. Not that kind of sorrow. I mean the kind of sorrow that a woman goes through when she's laboring and delivering. 
I don't know what that feels like. I don't know what kind of pain that is. But from the expression on my wife, that bothered me. I'd never seen her in that kind of pain before. I don't, so I, again, I don't know what, don't know how it feels, but I imagine it's pretty bad. So we're talking about some very serious sorrows coming in. And, and I want you to look then and see what he says in the scriptures about this. Second Corinthians seven, verse nine. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Let me stop right here. Now, remember what I said earlier that I believe that everything in this Bible that's written is not only true, 100% true, and always has been, but it's more relevant now, has more meaning for this time than it ever has. And, and think about what he just said here. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, which would you rather have? If you were choosing, you don't get the choice of godly sorrow, sorrow of the world, no sorrow. No sorrow, you don't get that choice. Sorrow's coming. It's happened to everybody, every kind of Christian, every kind of lost person there is. Sorrow happens, okay? But which one would you rather choose? The godly sorrow that worketh repentance or the sorrow of the world that's going to end up killing them all? I mean, some people just live the last few days in absolute misery, and then they die and they face judgment and they spend eternity in the lake of fire. We, on the other hand, God sees that, yeah, we're trying to follow him, we're striving, living by the Bible, but we've got some sin in our life. God uses godly sorrow in us th through circumstances, family members, things that don't go right, bills that don't get paid, whatever, health issues. And we recognize, Mike, that's because of sin. That's the sin in your life. It causes us to, to repent. And then once the repentance is made, read Psalm 32 about that. Oh my goodness. It's like the weight of the world has been taken off your shoulders. So. Again, which one would you choose? The godly sorrow that worketh repentance unto salvation or the sorrow of the world that bringeth death? Me? I'm choosing the godly sorrow because look at what it does. Verse 11. For behold this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So we go back to uh, Matthew 24, because he says here, for then shall be a time of great sorrow. Yeah, all these are the beginning of sorrows. So for the world, that's going to be sorrow unto death. God's going to bring the man of sin, the son of perdition, Mr. Death himself, and everybody's going to be transformed literally to be second dead, twice dead already, twofold the child of hell, he said in Matthew 23. But with us, it's going to bring our second life. It's going to bring the translation, the rapture. Sorrow before rapture. I think that would be best, don't you? So when he says, you know, it's going to bring about carefulness in us. We don't want to go into those traps again that we fell into. 
clearing of ourselves, getting rid of that old junk in our lives, indignation against you're indignant about ever falling into that sin to begin with. You hate it. The vehement desire and zeal and revenge. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. That's our revenge that God's going to give us. So you see this, this time of sorrow. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And he says later on, but the end is not yet. So what if there are some sorrows to endure? We, we endure sorrow now here. So how is that going to be any different? In fact, I've always said this. I think the sorrows that we go through now are basically training us for the sorrows that are going to come then. But then, I mean, think of what Christ endured before he went to the cross, before he went to the cross, then at the cross, then on the cross, and then it is finished. But what after the cross? Wasn't that great? I think that's how it's going to happen. Now, we're going to let the Bible then define the meaning of the word sorrow. Yeah, it has the word sorry in it. When we feel, if, if I do something, I know it just, I upset my wife. I do. I feel sorry for that. I don't like hurting my wife. I don't like upsetting her. I don't like that. I, I care about her. So when I tell her that I'm sorry I did something, I, I, it's genuine. I feel sorrow. I feel terrible about that. Hurting anybody, I feel terrible about that. But what does God associate these sorrows with? There's a concept in the Bible. Oh, understanding this, I think, is very, very important. Understanding coming the Antichrist, the coming of Christ in the air, the translation, the rapture. Look at it. Genesis chapter 3, right after the sin, right after... You know, yea, hath God said, and the Eve's looking at the fruit, and the devil didn't make her do it. She did it, and she gave it to Adam, and they both now are in a fallen state, and God's laying curses on them. What curse did he give to the woman? And remember, women in the Bible are types of churches. Good or bad, that's what they're a type of. Babylon's a woman, she's a bad church. Uh, Jerusalem above, which is free as the mother of us all, she's the good church. So think about this. Genesis 3.16, the curse that God gave to the woman was, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over he. Now stop right here. There's, lo I, there's loads of doctrine here. But look at what he said. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. So in your mind, think Bible. Think of stories in the Bible where a woman had a baby. Well, of course, Jesus, right? Think of all these other women. What was their main story about? What was Sarah's big, what was the big story about Sarah? Sarah. It wasn't the fact that she ate a cheeseburger for the first time, was it? No. It was her giving birth at 90 years old. Rachel. Two stories about her, the one that she was the, the better looking of the two, and she was the, the first love. What was the second story? Was that God was opening up the womb of her sister, but not hers, until finally she had a baby. The Shunammite woman, Elisha, right? What was her, what was the big story about her? The birth, death, rebirth of her son. Okay. Um, Manoah's wife, Samson's mother. Again, a woman couldn't have a baby. Hannah, it, who was it? Eliakim, uh, or Elkanah, excuse me. What was her big story? 
What is she known for? Not being able to have a baby, and yet she had a baby. So this is not just a little side thing in the Bible where we, um, you know, or just this is just one, mentioned one time in the Bible. This is one of those stories keeps popping up over and over and over again. Now we're going to read the rest of this verse and watch as that pen magically appears in my hand. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Who's our husband? It's Jesus Christ. Who is our desire? It's him. Who rules over us? Jesus Christ. So do you understand this, all these things that God says, you know, eventually they all end up being blessings for some reason. Everything the devil and we get ourselves into, it turns out bad. God always says, you know what? I can make that a blessing easily. So yes, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, but they're bringing forth children. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and yet what a husband. And he shall rule over thee. And that's a whole lot better than us ruling over ourselves. Amen? Now, let me add to that Isaiah 13, 8. And they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrow. So now, stop. The Bible's linked those two verses. Oh, by the way, I told you the pen would show up again. They shall be afraid, pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. Now the Bible's attaching these two words together. Sorrows, not 100% of the time, mind you, but sorrows often accompanies pangs. So if Jesus said, uh, all these are the beginning of sorrows, and sorrows is attached more than once, and we'll read it with pangs. And what kind of pangs? They shall be afraid, pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another, the faces shall be as flames. Birth, pangs, and sorrows. So back to this verse. All these are the beginning of sorrows. I mean, my wife and I, we've had several children now. And I remember those days, she would start having the contractions. Okay, maybe we should go to the hospital. Not yet, but it's getting close. And then I'll never forget the one night we were not expecting it. Boom! Water everywhere. Now we're going to the hospital. Okay? If he says they're the beginning of sorrows, well, we know that the birth is coming, but there is a little while. And again, it don't take seven years to give birth to a child. It don't take three and a half years to give birth to a child. So don't assume that I'm saying or that I even believe all this is going to go on for seven years or three, because I don't believe it. Okay? I believe in a time appointed, an amount of days, but I don't believe it's three and a half years. I don't believe it's seven years. Okay? I do believe in a the beast shall reign three and a half years. That I believe. But I don't think we're going to be here that whole time. Anyway, moving on. So you get where I'm going with this. We have Genesis 3. We have Isaiah 13 telling us that sorrows related to the birth pangs of a woman who is travailing. Why? Because she's about ready to give birth to a child. Jeremiah 13:21. What wilt thou say when he shall punish thee? For thou hast taught them to be captains, and as chief over thee, shall not sorrows take thee as a woman in travail? There's another one. That's like the third witness already. Hosea 13:13, 13, 13, the sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children. Notice here that it's talking about a guy. And yet it says the sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. Why? Because he's an unwise son. God says, I'm going to make him go through this. So now that's our fourth witness. Sorrows, birth pangs, a woman in travail. And again, I could ask you, 
Can you think of a verse in the Bible that says the day of the Lord is like a woman in travail? Well, you know we're eventually going to get there. John 16, 20. Oh, I love John. I got to turn there. John is my favorite gospel writer. He just, you know, it seems like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and nothing wrong with this, were giving a, an accurate historical account of what Jesus did and said. But with John, you felt the emotion, the passion. You felt like Jesus really was his best friend. And he, John, really was the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's how he wrote about himself in the Gospel of John. That's why I like John so much. But John 16, beautiful. I remember the first time as a young minister opening my Bible to read John 17, the Lord's prayer to his father in Gethsemane. And I bawled like a baby. I went, what love he has. What love Jesus has and what love John portrayed in this chapter. Anyway, John 16, there's a lot here. John 16, he's talking about the comforter coming. When he's come, he's going to reprove the world. He's going to do this. And let me read this. Um, verse 13 of John 16, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth for he will, shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he shall shew you things to come. So I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that everything that we need to know is right here in this book. I, I keep seeing people, and in fact, I saw a YouTube video that flew across the screen the other day. YouTube wanted me to watch it, and I said, not on your life. And if some guy making these claims about, oh, you ought to see how the Messiah is portrayed in the book of Enoch, I couldn't care less how the Messiah is portrayed in the book of Enoch, because number one, Enoch didn't write a book. Number two, don't believe that he did. It's not scripture, it's a lie, and I don't buy into any of it, and I'm absolutely not going to believe that Enoch had insights into the Messiah that nobody else did, and that's why we're missing the picture. And I've seen people talk about these Enochian prophecies of the Messiah and how that's really telling... People, if it's not Jesus, who is it? It's the Antichrist, okay? But anyway, John, John 16, he says he's going to show you things to come. So I believe it's all right here. Now, John 16, verse 21. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow. Think about what Jesus said now in Matthew 24. All these are the beginning of sorrows because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Who's that man? Who is that man? It's actually two of them. We'll get into that in a little bit. But you see now the connection. All these are the beginning of the sorrows. Sorrows, what are they related to? Travail, birth pangs, the appearance or the revelation of who the child is. All of this that's happening, the earthquakes and all of the other things that's going on, those are all leading up to the birth. You know, I, I've said this and it, it's a great if you just want to make it, as you turn to 1 Thessalonians 5 with me, if you just want to make a practical application of this, this is, this is truth. God works this way, and knowing how God works will help you get through some rough areas in your life. People have a lot of problems. Sometimes people go through some really, really bad problems. And sometimes they don't think they can make it. I've, I've been there. Didn't think I was going to live through some of the stuff. One or two times I thought, you know, maybe I'd just be better off dead and actually thought about it. But I didn't understand what God was doing. There is no birth without 
trouble, without sorrow, without pangs, without travail. But when you're going through the travail and the sorrow and the pangs, think about the joy that's going to come once that child is born. Again, I've never had children. I've just made a few. But I've asked my wife, is it true? Oh, yes. You are in agony until that child is born, and then boom, you don't remember any of it. You know, here it is, the first child my wife delivered. She wants to kill me. And then after that, all she thinks out, I'm off the hook now because we have the baby. Whew, thank God. That's how, that's how you do it. And I would say that any great thing, any great thing that God is going to birth in your life, will be preceded by travail, without a doubt. So you take that as an app, uh, just an application for the times we're living in right now. Any of you listening to me right now going through hard, hard times, whether it's yourself or your marriage or your family, what we're going through as a nation, something's about to be born. Whether it's going to be good or bad, I don't know. But remember, anuit coeptus novus ordus seclorum. He favors the birth of a new world order. So it could be that. I don't know. We'll see. But if you're going through trouble right now, just think, joy's coming because it's going to birth something really good in your life. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 5. But of the times and season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Now, whether you agree with me or not on, on anything I say about the timing of the rapture, we all agree God has not appointed us in the wrath. But I would just ask you to do just one simple thing. That's all you have to do. Concordance or Pure Bible Search Software or Blue Letter Bible, wh whichever one you want. Search every place in the King James Bible for the word tribulation or tribulations. Now, there's no tribulationer, tribulationing, tribulationingly. There's nothing like that. It's just two forms, tribulation, tribulations. Just look at those two words. Just look at them and read the verse they're in. Read what comes before and after. Okay? And ask the question, is it possible that God appoints us to tribulation? Is it possible that God appoints us to wrath? The answer is absolutely not. He doesn't. And some, again, well-meaning, I guess. I love them. They're my brothers. We believe the same Bible. But I've seen some very lame, vain attempts at saying, tribulation is the wrath of God. You see, that would contradict many scriptures that the Apostle Paul said. So I can't believe that, okay? But look at what he said. The day of the Lord so cometh. For when they say peace and safety, then, so, and I don't know who they is. Might be the same people that everybody gets all their weird information from. You know, they say this COVID thing will be over by, by summer. You know, they say if you don't wear a mask. You know, they say it's supposed to rain. I don't know that it's them or not. I don't know who's saying they, who they is that's saying peace and safety. 
What I absolutely guarantee you is whenever they say it, not only is sudden destruction going to come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, but I think God's people are going to know it. I think God's people are going to, you, you wouldn't believe how many times I've searched the internet looking for someone to say peace and safety. And I just, I don't do that anymore because I don't know that it'll necessarily be on the internet, but I know God's people will know. So, I mean, look at what he's saying here. We brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. And I've shared with you sort of my ideas about the coming of the Lord, the appearing of the Lord in the air, and that I think that it's possible that just prior to that happening, God's people know. Noah knew, Lot knew, those are good examples as it was in the days of Noah, as it was um, Elijah knew, Elisha knew, 50 of the sons of the prophets knew. Surely the Lord doeth nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. So when they call this a secret rapture, I mean, I kind of understand what they're getting at, but I don't necessarily agree that nobody is going to know it. I think God's people just prior to it, just like Noah did. Noah, for yet seven days. Elisha, they asked Elisha, dost thou know your massacre is going to be taken from thy head today? Yeah, I know it. Though they all knew it wasn't a secret to them. So that day, I don't believe, is going to overtake us as a thief. And then he says, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. And I think, oh, and I got something else to share with you too. I think the falling that takes place is going to take place as a result of God hitting people with a drunken spirit. That's what I think. You study wine and strong drink in the Bible. You study things that fall. Drunks, what do they do? They fall. And then he says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, what does that tie into? Oh, that one's easy. Well, Pastor Mike, that ties right into Ephesians chapter 6, you know, the verse you've been quoting 10,000 times. It's exactly right. And what does it tell us? Taking the shield of faith, take the helmet of salvation, stand therefore, having your loins girt about, um, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, take unto you the whole armor that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay? So I think all this ties in together. I think people are going to fall. But because we're not drunk, we'll be the ones still standing. Okay? Isaiah 13. We'll go back to that. How, verse 6, How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. And again, that links right back to 1 Thessalonians 5. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be flames. I've read that earlier, but look what it says now. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What did he say? The day of the Lord cometh. What was it that we just read? In fact, I'll go back to it. 1 Thessalonians 5. For you know, selves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the light. He mentions that it's the day of the Lord. And then in Isaiah 13, what does he say? The day of the Lord cometh. And how is it going to come? Like pangs and sorrow, like a woman in travail. And then look what he says here. 
cruel both with wrath and fierce angle to delay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Verse 10, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Now, what is that, what is that related to? Joel chapter 1, Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, Revelation chapter 6, and... Oh, yeah. Matthew chapter 24, when it says, And immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That happens before Jesus sends his angels with the great sound of a trumpet to gather together his elect. The gathering is what's mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2. Okay? You see, even though I might want to believe in a pre-trib, pre-nothing happens before the rapture, just so I don't get hurt. I, the scriptures that I read won't let me believe that. I can't reconcile the connection that all of these are making. Here, Isaiah 13 says it's the day of the Lord, it's a day of travailing, and oh, by the way, the stars of heaven and are going to fall, and the moon's not going to give her light, and the sun's not going to shine. Same thing he said in Joel, same thing he says in Acts, same things he says in Matthew 24, same thing he says in Revelation chapter 6. I can't deny that. I can't overlook it. And I can't say, oh, well, maybe it happens twice. Well, I don't think so. Because there's no mention of it when you get into the vials of wrath. Once the vials of wrath are poured out, Jesus comes down and will ride horse, right? Taking over and, okay, this planet's mine. So again, I'd like to agree with my brothers, and I'd like for my brothers to agree with me. But I have to stick with the scriptures. Isaiah 21, verse 3, verse three Therefore are my loins filled with pain. You know what that is, don't you? You know how that feels, right? Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Now look what he says in verse 9. And behold, there cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. So now what is this saying? Pangs of a woman that travails and the falling away. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Twice. Why? Because the Lord speaketh once, yea, twice. The Lord speaketh once, yea, twice. The Lord speaketh once. That's Jesus coming the first time. The Lord speaketh twice. Jesus coming the second time. Babylon. You could say Babylon fell when Christ died on the cross. Babylon's going to fall again when Christ returns second time, this time for good. It's like Dagon. How many times did he fall? Once, they set him back up. Twice, he stays fallen. Okay? See how things work now in the Bible. Isaiah 54, single barren thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Mm. So look at Galatians 4. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac, are the children of promise. Now don't you think of two things here. Remember, I mentioned Rachel and Leah. Leah was fruitful. 
but she was the ugly sister, right? Think of the Gentiles, Gentile church. Even though Rachel was chosen first, Leah is first. And think about what Jesus said. He who is last shall be first. He who is first shall be last. So in that instance, that's exactly how it happened. The first was last and the last was first. So Israel is Christ's true love, Rachel. But she's barren. She brings forth no fruit. Now we, the Gentiles, on the other hand, we're the vine of Christ, we're his church, we're bringing forth fruit right and left, okay? But Israel's not. But who's Christ's love more? You always illustrate it like this. I started thinking of the 12 ribs that we have on each side. 12 on this side, 12 on this side, 24. And I thought, okay, that will represent the Gentiles and Israel. Well, which side represents the Gentiles? I think the right side. Right hand, you know, where strength is. But where's your heart? Just over to the left. That's where Israel is. His heart really is with the Jews, Israel. And even though she's never born in a child, she's never brought forth fruit, she's going to. She's going to. Okay? And her seed will be as the stars of heaven for number. Stars are angels, by the way. And that's what Paul's getting at here. Because he's, he's talking about the two types, Hagar and Sarah. And Hagar represents Israel that now is, and Jerusalem that now is, under bondage, cast out. Sarah represents those who are born free. And then she represents Jerusalem above, a woman in heaven, right? A woman in heaven, which is the mother of us all. You got that? Now, Revelation 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, in pain to be delivered. So this woman's going to give birth to a child, right? Who is that child? She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. You know what that exact phrase is in Latin? Raptire, or something like that. Rapture. So it's, it's Christ, right? Is it only Christ? Well, yeah. But remember how God said in Hebrews, um, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. We know that God prepared the body of Christ's first coming, which was the little baby born in Bethlehem. But what is the body of Christ's second coming? It's us. We're the body of his second coming. So, the phrase, caught up, the child was caught up into God and to his throne. It's the exact same word used, 1 Thessalonians 4. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, the dead in Christ, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You see, I think those are connected because of the unique language structure of the King James Bible, that it connects Revelation 12. Because if you want to look at it, 
He says in Revelation 2:26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Well, that's talking to church people. Look at Revelation 19:15. Out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Well, that's what he said of the child in Revelation 12. That the child that's caught up is going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And he says it to both Jesus and the church who are both caught up after the time of travail. I love this. So the sorrows, I think the sorrows have to, have to be there. I think the travail has to come. The child has to be born, okay? And I think that's us in Christ meeting in the air. I mentioned another child, didn't I? Remember, 2 Thessalonians says, uh, For that day shall not come, except there coming a falling away. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or this worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I finally get here after I've quoted the whole thing. And then shall that wicked be revealed. See, we don't know who it is yet. Somebody asked me, do you think the Antichrist is on the earth right now? And I, kind of, I said, no, but I said, well, no, wait a minute. Maybe he is, but we don't know who it is. But if I were to just guess, I would say no. I think he's still hidden. Now we know in Revelation 13 is going to rise up out of the sea. Do you know the water that comes out of the uterus when a child is born? Exact same as salt water from the sea. We're literally born out of the sea like the beast the man of sin the son of perdition and I think we have a picture of that 1 Samuel 4 19 remember the ark of the Lord had been taken been stolen Eli fell away fell backward when he heard that so what is it saying here that day shall not come except there shall come a falling away first Okay. Only he who now letteth will let until be taken out of the way, and the Ark of the Covenant was taken out of the way. And then what happened when those events took place? See, Hophni and Phinehas were the wonder twins of evil, the sons of Eli who were, my goodness, they were thieves, womanizers, probably went after girls too, you never know. Those two boys were evil, wicked, like politicians, right? Well, Phineas' wife was about to be delivered. And look at the story. First Samuel 4, 19, his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. Do you see the words now? And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. Who was her child? Her child was the man of sin, the son of perdition, who was being revealed for the very first time to the world. And that's what I think is going to happen. The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. You see, that's the revelation of the man of sin. The glory being departed, instead of, instead of the glory of the Lord being revealed, which is Christ, 
the birth of this child, the man of sin. See, nobody knows who he is right now. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Just like this child being born out of sin, out of disobedience, out of the ark of God, which for some strange reason they said it will save us like the ark like it's some big power machine that they have to have you know to drive all their enemies away God was so far from them they had religion they had a knowledge of, re of religion they had a form of religion they didn't have God with them and it's the way it is with a lot of people in a lot of churches the glory is departed and one of these days God's glory is going to leave the people of this earth with the exception of God's people in Jesus Christ. So, like I said, there is sorrows going to happen to everybody. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, and we don't need to be sorry about that. When that, when that happens, then we'll be glad forever. But the sorrow of the world, Ichabod, see, she travailed too. Lost women and saved women both travail in pain. It's just that when their time comes, did it bring death? What happened to Phineas' wife after she delivered? killed her. What happens to us when Christ appears? We're alive forevermore. Amen? Go back through the Bible, study all these women that didn't have, couldn't have babies and all of a sudden they had babies. God bless them. They're all uh, Ruth and Naomi. Think about that, okay? All of these pictures of Christ coming and like I said, all the terrible things that have happened, you wouldn't believe what I've gone through today to get this recording done, okay? But if it blesses one person, and I mean really blesses them, gives them something that maybe they've never seen before, maybe they makes them eager to study more out of the scriptures, then my travail for you will be a blessing. And I love to be a blessing. Hope I can always be a blessing because you're the reason why I do what I do. May the Lord bless you. We're going to keep studying Matthew 24. Got homecoming coming up. So got a lot of other things to study too. And what I told you, God shared with me last night. That's going to be some pretty spooky stuff. So be watching for that and pray for me. Will you do that? Love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.